everyone. Thank you for joining the talk today. Um, this event is in collaboration with the Happiness Festival organized by the Happiness Institute. The festival supports the uh, WHO COVID Relief Fund. You can see the donation details via YouTube giving. Um, you can do, um, all donations can be matched double by Google. The Happiness Festival launches on the 24th to 26th July, when this interview will be publicly released. We're honored today to have Professor Robert Wardinger joining us to discuss what makes a good life. Professor Robert Wardinger is a psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, and Zen priest. He is clinical professor of uh, psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and directs the Harvard study of adult, de uh, the adult development, one of the longest running studies of adult life ever done. The study tracked the lives of two groups, two groups of men for over 75 years. He writes about what science and Zen can teach us about healthy human development. Um, his TED talk is very much uh, viewed online. You can check it out uh, at TED.com. Let's please welcome Professor Rob Robert Wardinger on stage. Hi, it's great okay. to be here. Yes, hi, thank you for, for coming today. Um, first of all, uh, maybe tell us a bit uh, about your research um, and what does it tell us about the basic conditions of human happiness? I think that's very important and fundamental research that we have today. Sure. What's unusual about this research is that it's gone on for so long. We're actually in our 83rd year. This was a study that started in 1938 and followed the same people from the time they were teenagers all the way into old age. And so almost all have passed away. There were originally 724 men and they are now, there are a few who are still alive and they're in their mid to late nineties, but we've followed them and asked them year after year about their lives and gotten their health records. We interviewed their parents way back when. And then of course we, talked with their wives and their children, and we're gonna start studying their grandchildren. So it's a great, big, long study. And the good thing about it is that almost everybody stayed in the study. That's almost unheard of. Like very few people dropped out over those 82 years. So what we've done is tried to understand, well, what actually helps people thrive? as they go through their lives. And so we're interested in both thriving emotionally, emotional well-being, and we're interested in physical health, both of those. What keeps us happy? What keeps us healthy? That's what our study is about. Cool. Um, I think many of us have uh, watched your TED talk. I think it's a very inspirational talk. So what are the key findings from, from this research and, and what does happiness mean to you from you know, having directed the research for so long? Happiness doesn't mean being happy all the time. Like that's really key. Cause sometimes with all of our emphasis on happiness, we can give people the impression that if you're really doing your life right, you'll be happy all the time. You'll be happy every day. And we know that that's just not true. So when I think about happiness, what I really am thinking about is well-being, which is essentially a kind of bedrock of having the basics of what you need so that even on bad days, you're okay. That's different from being happy all the time. Um, so, so happiness to me means well-being. And, and what we found is, first of all, that every life has troubles in it. Every life has challenges, hard stuff. But that one of the strongest findings we is that the quality of your relationships with other people was hugely important in how happy you are, but also how physically healthy you are you are. The people who had warmer, good relationships, close but also not close, just acquaintances, that all of that contributed to physical health and to emotional well-being. Interesting. Um, so are there elements, are there equations for a good life? Are there formulas or like, uh, you know, five building blocks for a good life? Because the title of the talk is what makes a good life. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are no formulas. 
Like people will try to tell you there are six things you can do tonight to be happy and all that. And yes, that's partly true. There are some things, but the, there, the building blocks are pretty clear. So there are building blocks about physical well-being. We know, for example, that taking care of yourself, taking care of your body is hugely important. So getting enough sleep, getting exercise, eating decent food, not abusing drugs or alcohol, not smoking, if you can not smoke, all of those things contribute to longer life and more emotional well-being and stability. And then, as I said, tending to relationships so that you minimize the negativity in your relationships and you try to nurture the positive aspects of relationships. So I would say those are the basic building blocks. No big surprise. All of that information has been out there for centuries, certainly for decades, about exercise, diet, not smoking. Um, but I think that the interesting uh, take home is about relationships contributing to emotional and physical well being. That's somewhat newer in our body of knowledge. Yeah, I think it also uh, kind of. Um uh, you know, reflects a few, quite a few other studies around happiness. I think many studies now have concluded that relationships and social uh, credit is probably the most important factor in happiness over, over, or, overall. Yeah. Yes, and Kieran, that's really important because no single study can demonstrate something that's absolutely true that we can be absolutely certain of. So what we want is to see multiple studies confirming the same facts. And if that happens, then we can believe in them. Then we know that, for example, our one study, even though it's very long and powerful and had a fair number of people in it, our one study can't prove anything all by itself. So we look at what other studies have shown. Um, and so what you're saying is exactly right, that the fact that many studies have all pointed to this same fact can can help us have more confidence in the truth of it yeah so i think um i think many people know that relationships are important and community and friendships or tribe is important um, but do you have any insight in terms of how to better find them because how i to better find tribes yes yeah mm. boy is that a good question especially when we're worried now about tribes. I mean, we are tribal creatures. Um, banding together not only feels good, but it gives us more support. Um, there's an old African proverb. Um, if you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. So this idea that when we invest in communities, we can do more, we are more powerful, that is absolutely true. So then, then your question is really key. How, how can a tribe give us benefits without being divisive, without being uh, a force for uh, negative impact on all of us? And I think that's where a lot of discernment needs to happen. So how can we celebrate identities so individual identities are, are important. You know, ethnic groups, gender, uh, all kinds of identities that we have. But how can we do that without making other people seem alien and making them the enemies? And that is the, the great challenge, particularly of this time in our yeah. cultures. Yeah, um, I will go back to this time a bit later. I think that's a bigger topic. Um, so just stay on the tribe bit a little bit more. Um, do you think yeah. if, if we if we reflect on our societies and economies, do you think we have enough guidance to help us find the right tribe? Because most of people today are more focused on career and achievement. And you have mentioned that in the talk as well. Mm -hmm. So if we could imagine, say, you know, um, in improvement of future policymaking, et cetera, what kind of tools and techniques we should give to people to help everybody find their tribe? Yeah. I guess the first thing I would say is 
to think about the importance of investing in something beyond the self and even something beyond your immediate family. So, so many of us are, are, we have so many responsibilities. We are trying to raise children. We're trying to have careers. We're trying to take care of loved ones who may be sick. So many things we have to do. But the fact is that people are happier and healthier when they invest in something bigger than their small self and small world. So probably the way to find a tribe is to think, what are the things I most care about that I want to live in the world because I've been here? And so if you think, what do I want to live in the world? And then find a place to devote your energies to that. You will meet other people who care about the same thing. Uh, that's a way to make new relationships. Um, and you will be doing something that feels important. And that, it, that feeling that what I'm doing matters is a really big contributor to well-being. Yeah, so it's very much a purpose-driven approach to finding yes. a tribe. Yes. Um, so another thing that uh, made me think after watching your TED talk is because the study has lasted for so long, you really have like this longevity view of happiness. And I think for many of us who are still relatively young, we are very much focused on career and, you know, um, making effort to make more money, you know, get promoted and all that kind of stuff. Um, so what's your view after having seen people going through their life, um, the balance between enjoying the present versus working for the joy of the future. So it's like joy of now versus joy of future, because I feel that very often we are uh, compromising for the joy of the future so that we are doing something that we don't want to do today in order we can live a better life in the future. Yes. And of course, it's a, it's a constant uh, tension right between what do I do right now to take care of myself to be happy to have fun and what do I what do I put off how do I delay gratification so that I can have that bigger thing in the future and it can't be either or that what we find is that if we go to either extreme um, we suffer so if we're just interested in having fun right now all kinds of important things don't happen in our lives. We can't provide for ourselves or our families. We, we get into all kinds of trouble. But if we only delay gratification, then people turn around, certainly in our study, they've turned around in their 70s and 80s and said, my God, I worked all my life and I never knew my kids when they were growing up. Or I never spent that time gardening the way I used to love to do when I was a kid or, you know, any number of things. So it, it, I like to think of them as polarities that we go back and forth, that we, we, we spend time in the now, enjoying the now we spend time investing in the future and that it is a constant interplay and back and forth. Interesting. Very cool. Thank you. Um, so let's maybe touch a bit on the current situation. I think it's it's very relevant, you know, the discussion about tribe and community. And I think now the physical distancing and social distancing has really impacted how people can connect with each other. Um, so what is your advice for people, global audience actually going through the current crisis, leveraging from the research? Uh, what are the practical tools that we can leverage from study to um, help us cope with the situation a bit better? Yeah. Ah. <sighs> Such, such an important question. Um, you know, the, 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 the thing about our situation now, particularly as we do social distancing and as we stay home more, is that our lives have been frozen in a certain way that we are forced to be with some people more than we were ever with them before. Like we are forced to be with our partners, for example, or our roommates or our, our children 24-7. And actually, most of the time, we're not used to being with each other 24-7. Nobody signed up for that. When I you know, signed up to get married, I didn't sign up for, for all day, every day, forever. Uh, we've been used to going our separate ways. So what do we do now? 
when we have to be with people more than we're used to. And that's where I think we learn to give each other space and we learn that there is nothing wrong with my relationship if I don't want to be with my roommate all day long, if I get irritated and need to get some distance uh, at home. Sometimes you can't get distance. You just have to get kind of personal distance where you're in your corner. But still, distance distance doesn't mean our relationships are bad at home. They just means means that this is a new situation. And the alternative, of course, the other side of the frozen life is that we can't see some of the people that we were so accustomed to seeing. We can't visit grandparents, particularly people in retirement homes, nursing homes. We can't, sometimes we can't be with romantic partners who are far away and we're used to being able to travel to see. We can't be with children who live far away, so many people. And I think that advice is more about reaching out, about making the extra effort. So what I've found is that if we think about, I wonder how so-and-so is doing. They're living alone in an apartment. If you think of it, reach out. Don't let that moment pass, um, that, unless it's 3 a.m. perhaps. But, but that if you, you know, that, 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 that when, when the impulse occurs to you to reach out, go that extra step and actually do it and do it more often than you might normally do it when we weren't in a time of social distancing. People will be so pleased to hear from you, almost 100%, because everybody is feeling the need to sustain these connections that have been frozen by the pandemic. Yeah, so uh, great. Um, what's your advice for people who are going through more stressful situations like uh, just the social distancing because many people having professional relationship with crisis at the moment, um, especially from your background in Zen, um, do you have any tips in terms of stress management? Oh, yes. Well, first of all, yeah, as you say, there are so many stressors. I mean, many people have been laid off from their jobs. Um, you know, many people are facing financial crises that they uh, were completely unexpected. Um, I think from the Zen perspective, Zen, Zen teaches us that this is our life right this moment, right? There is no other life except what's happening right now. And we often say, wait, I don't want this to be my life. And of course, we don't want the pandemic. Uh, nobody wants to be laid off from a job. Um, and so what Zen teaches us is to be with whatever is. It doesn't mean you have to like it. Just be present for it. Don't push it away. Just know, okay, here it is. I don't like this. What are the feelings that come up? And now, where does it lead me next? The, the One of the one of the teachings about Zen that I find so useful is this idea that we never know what's really good or bad. That, for example, right now may feel like a bad time. I've just been laid off from my job. Um, and in fact, I was fired from a job early on in my career as a psychiatrist. And I thought, oh my gosh, they don't want me. And I was, I was, and then it opened a door to another avenue that led me toward doing the research I'm doing now, completely unexpected. That's just a way of saying that what Zen teaches us is that even the things we think are bad right now are simply uh, new events coming along and we don't know how it's gonna turn out. Leave yourself open to the possibility that what seems like a disaster right now may lead to good things you've never dreamed of. Yeah, I mean, definitely many people also see opportunity in this crisis, right? This is very much a, a Taoist view as well, the yin and yang, everything is, you know, kind of interplay. Um, so what have we learned from history? Because the study has gone so long and start, it started right after the war. So I'm sure you have seen people going through trauma, going through historical 
incidents, um, what have we learned about resilience from the study? Yes, yes. Our original participants in our study were born during the depression uh, or were children during the Great Depression. So they all remember it. Then many of them served in World War II. So huge events in the life of a world, of a country uh, that they couldn't predict and they couldn't help. And when we asked people, what got you through the Great Depression? What got you through being a soldier in combat in World War II? Everybody talked about other people getting them through, that the relationships they had were the things that, they, that were the most memorable, that were the most helpful, that got them through times that they thought were unbearable and that they would never get through. So I think what we learn again is that our social connections form a kind of safety net through hard times and through unexpected times. And that's important because, you know, now we have the pandemic. Six months ago, we wouldn't have dreamed that this was going to be our life. But let's face it, once the pandemic is over, new things are going to come along in life. And what our study has taught us is that solid relationships are a buffer against these unpredictable things that come along. Um, so does that make this pandemic also a good time to study resilience and social connections? Um, because this is such an extended period of isolation. Um, um, I wonder what could we learn once this is over about you know, happiness, resilience, and all these topics, because this is a unique time that you can actually, you know, reflect on these topics much deeper. Yes. yes. And I think you're right that, that we can think about, and the pandemic is causing us to think about, what are my strengths here? How am I getting through this? And I think many of us are surprised that we're able to get through it, that this is that, that I've managed. Yes, it's been hard, but I've managed this lockdown. I've managed this social distancing. I've even managed a job loss. And, and to think, okay, what, what have I been able to do? How have I been able to use um, this crisis? And what am I learning about my capabilities that I didn't know before? The other thing is, what am I learning about what's really important to me? I mean, many people are finding that they really don't want to commute if they don't have to. And that, that that may be an important thing to do away with when you have that option. Of course, it, it, not everyone has that option. But in other words, we can learn both what are some of the capabilities that I have that I didn't know about before that are enabling me to get through this? And what are some of the things in my life that I thought I needed that I really don't have to have in order to be okay. Yeah, so that goes to um, kind of a, you know, going beyond the pandemic, right? So I think most of the world are on path of recovery, even though there is a risk of second wave, but eventually this will be over. So when this is over, I think there are many things that we will think and reflect on in terms of what is the new economy, right? Because for example, there is um, a lot of things happening in virtual economy now. Uh, so the virtual economy definitely has picked up uh, because of the pandemic. And uh, most people really will cherish much more social connections. Uh, and I think there is a lot around environment and uh, I think we are going to support more greener economy as well. Um, where do you see happiness in this new economy? Do you think it will be much more of a priority in our policy and economic um, you know, decision-making um, because we have talked to uh, a few experts also on you know, the, the economic matrices and where happiness fit into it. Um, so what's your view about happiness as a, as a priority in our, in, our, uh, in our economy? Happiness has become more and more of a driver uh, before, well, long before this current crisis. So, you know, as we know, more than 20 years ago, the, the kingdom of Bhutan uh, had the concept of gross national happiness, 
something that we need to measure and foster and keep track of just as much as we need to measure gross gross national product and economic growth. And happiness ministries have popped up in um, the Emirates, in various other countries. There's a ministry of loneliness in the United Kingdom. Um, so I think that what we are seeing is more and more um, calling out of this need for well-being and prioritizing well-being. And I think at structurally, as this starts to happen, um, policies will be uh, shaped with an eye toward well-being. So, for example, in Bhutan now, every time a bill comes before their legislative body, it has to include an analysis of how it will affect the happiness of the population if they enact this measure. Um, an amazing thing to have to uh, account, be accountable for. Probably, I know in the United Kingdom now, the eye toward decreasing loneliness means that government policy is keeping an eye on social isolation and how to foster more connection. It seems to me that the pandemic is going to accelerate that, just as it is accelerating some other things, because the pandemic is making more people stop and say, hmm, Emotional well-being is so important, and all of these other things I was chasing don't seem as vital to me anymore. And so my hope is that all of us, there will be more of a groundswell of support for policymaking and body and, and, and government bodies and legislative bodies that make well-being a priority. So my, that's my, my hopeful vision for what happens as we emerge from this crisis. Yeah, I think that will be an amazing opportunity that we take from this crisis as well. Um, so last question from me before we open to the floor. Um, so if you have any questions, please type in comments uh, on YouTube uh, and we will pick up questions from there. Um, so in terms of the next phase of the study, I, I do hope that it will continue because it has lasted for so long. So what, what do you plan to learn in the next generation mm. of the study? Mm. We just finished studying all the children of the original subjects. The children are all baby boomers, mostly. They, they are all in their 50s and 60s. What we now are going to do is reach out to the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. And what we've learned is that the age range of the grandchildren and great-grandchildren is ranges from less than one year old there's a baby in our next group and um, into their 50s. So we have a very broad range of people. And what we want to study is again, this question of what connects us, what divides us, and how does that shape our well being? So in this phase of our study, we're going to look very closely at the digital revolution and how that is affecting both our ability to connect with each other and ways that the digital revolution disconnects us and try to understand more about uh, what works for whom and how we can help people learn about how to be their best selves as they encounter screens and social media and how to avoid some of the darker places that we can go to. Uh, in encountering the digital revolution. So that's our hope for this next wave. And we're hoping in the next year to start launching this. We've formed the Lifespan Research Foundation, which is a foundation to, to continue supporting the study and to bring our, our findings from the study to the public in ways that people can use to really make their lives better. So that's our next wave. Fascinating. So in terms of the time frame, I, I really love the fact that this is such a long run, you know, long, long, long run study because time really is important, you know, to gain insight. Uh, but is it possible to have more kind of uh, interim results, uh, especially when it comes to digital? I think we all want to learn how digital has impacted mm. our happiness sooner than, you know, wait for 75 years. 
Yes. No, you won't have, I promise <laughs> we, won't, we won't make you wait for 75 years. No, it, but it may take, you know, two, three, four years. Uh, so we are now publishing really important papers from our second generation study. Uh, papers looking at the, the, how childhood experiences and particularly adverse experiences affect our adult lives. We're learning how mindfulness can be protective against cardiovascular illness. We're learning all kinds of things. So our hope is that we start collecting information from the grandchildren and the great grandchildren in the next year, two years, and that then shortly thereafter, we start publishing our findings. But in the meantime, go to our website, uh, lifespanresearch.org, and you can see some of our findings. We also have adultdevelopmentstudy.org, and you can download some of our papers. So a lot of our findings are out there. Uh, hundreds of papers, many books. Awesome. Thank you. We will take a look. Um, so let's open the floor to questions. Um, let's see. So here's a question from uh, uh, Sian Goodin. Uh, I wonder about the link between not taking drugs and happiness as often and happens drive people towards the behavior to begin with. Seems like a difficult factor to control or investigate. Mm. That's a great question, Sian. What we found was that alcoholism was a factor in breaking up more than half of the marriages that broke up among our original participants. Uh, that, and that was alcoholism was by far the more common drug uh, back in the days when our study started. Now the, the range of drugs is wider. But you are absolutely right that this is an important driver of one of the things we know is that when people are in emotional distress, they reach for drugs because they make you feel better in the short run. And so it's very difficult to, to stay away from drugs when you're in a lot of emotional pain. All of that has been studied, continues to be studied. But I think that the, the hope is that when people are in emotional pain, they will reach out for help to other friends and family. They'll reach out professionally for mental health care um, rather than turning to drugs because drugs are primary drivers of unhappiness and poor health. Yeah, I think, I think um, we need to spend more time understanding the need behind the emotional hunger, you know, around, you know, yeah. resorting to drug or alcohol and providing more tools to people, um, you know, with healthier options. Um, and I think even today, we probably don't have a lot of those options well known, you know, in the society. So that, that's something we should work on. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, let's take next question. Etho, um, how did how did people in your study cross over from zenning out to letting go of things that are causing us unhappiness? Mm, how did their decision affect their life trajectories and overall happiness? So I think this is a great question. Very often you feel like if you're super zen, you are like not really living it either, right? Because you're mm. zooming out. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. So first of all, let me just say that we use that phrase zenning out in the culture uh, to kind of mean zoning out, like being disengaged, detached. And actually real Zen practice as lots of spiritual practice is about being very present for your life. So actually I'm, you know, I'm a Zen teacher and been doing it for a long time and I am not Zened out and detached. I feel things very strongly and it helps me feel more alive. But, but I think to, to go to, to the second part of your question, how did people let go of things? And I think that the, the happiest people, the people who thrived were the people who stayed engaged with life. So they didn't let go and go to mountaintops and become hermits. Not that that's bad, but people didn't do that by and large. 
They stayed engaged, but they let go of things when it was time to let go of them. So for example, you know, I'm in my 60s. There are a lot of things I can't do anymore. And if I kept trying to do them, like I used to love to run and, and it doesn't do good things for my body now. If I kept trying to do that, I would hurt myself. If we try to work at the pace that we used to, exercise at the pace that we used to, um, we will uh, find ourselves in trouble. So it's really about, rather than letting go of the world, it's about discerning how to shift toward things that uh, give us joy and give us energy at different times of our lives. And the people who did that in our study were the people who were really happy as they went through middle age, as they got to late life, even as they approached death. Yeah, so I think even for me, like I've been looking into uh, emotional agility. I think that's something that we need to practice more. So basically being able to shift from, you know, being very present, you know, living, you know, the moment and enjoying it, enjoying everything without feeling, having to detach from it because you are worried about that this might be gone, you know, the next moment. But then being able to let go when it's actually gone. So I think that is agility that we all need to practice. Is this something that comes with age or practice or how do we mm. achieve more agility? I don't know because I've, I've gotten older and I've been practicing Zen and I don't know what was responsible for what, but I can tell you that, the, that any practice, it could be gardening, it could be walking in nature, but any practice that lets you meet what's coming up, like meet an emotion, and then watch it come up, not necessarily act on it, because we don't act on all of our emotions, um, but then watch it pass away and just be with it. Any practice like that fosters more emotional agility, as you say, and allows us to be with emotions and then let them go. And, and that seems to promote well-being. But definitely let ourselves feel things because uh, that's part of being alive, the good stuff and the bad stuff. Yeah, I think people are afraid of the bad stuff. That's where the question comes Yeah. From. Yeah. But, you know, it's like what they tell me about my weather here in New England, in this part of the United States. <laughs> if you don't like what's happening, just wait a little while and it will change. Yeah. Same I'm with emotions. Yeah, I'm sitting in London. I know what you mean. Um, so let's go to the next question. Um, did you dive deep into figuring out what was it about having stronger relationships that led to increased happiness? Yes, thank you for asking that question. I love that question because that's a big part of what we've been studying in this second generation study. We're trying to look at the biological mechanisms that how does how do relationships get into the body get under the skin and actually you know keep us healthier if if good relationships prevent us from getting type 2 diabetes prevent us from getting heart disease how does that actually happen so we're looking into certain biological mechanisms we're looking into chronic inflammation so for example it seems that stress that chronically being under stress sets up a chronic fight or flight response in the body and that causes low grade inflammation that goes on all the time not the kind of healthy inflammation that we want to fight an infection right um and heal a wound no this is a kind of chronic low grade inflammation that gradually breaks down body systems and so what we're looking at is how good relationships lower our levels of inflammation in the body and more high stress relationships can increase our chronic inflammation and other stress hormones that break down the body. So thank you for that question. And we are, we are just now looking into uh, including genetics, epigenetics, hormonal data, and it's wonderful. I could go on and on, but I, better stop, but it's really cool stuff. Yeah, and uh, check out the website as well. I think all the reports yeah. as well. Um, so let's take last two questions. 
um, is there a reason that only men were selected for the first study? And will the next phase include women or people who don't identify with the gender? Yes, Maggie, thank you for that question. It, the, the original participants were only men because it was the 1930s. And for some reason, they thought that if you wanted to study normal young adult development, you studied all white men. I mean, you know, how politically incorrect can you get? So we have uh, all the second generation is, is a study of men and women. Actually, over half of the people we've studied in the second generation are women. The same will be the case in studying the third and fourth generations. So thank you for that. We are also looking into incorporating another sample that's more ethnically and racially diverse. Right now, we've stayed with our one sample, which is all Caucasian, because the power of our study is in having intergenerational information, parents, grandparents, and now children. But we are expanding first to uh, make sure we are gender balanced, and then we are going to try to be more um, ethnically and demographically balanced as well. So thanks for asking that question. Thank you. So let's see who is the lucky one to get the last question um, from John. Do we know much about the biological impact of quality relationships? What is happening in the brain? So I do know that you do brain scans. What have you found? Yes, yes. So we did brain scans and what, what we found was that the people who were happier, the people who's, who were more content with life, when we scanned their brains, they had better communication among different areas of the brain. The, the areas of the brain responsible for processing positive emotion lit up in synchrony when they looked at pictures of flowers and happy things. And so what we learned was that there was better connectivity in the brains of people who were happier particularly when they looked at emotional stimuli. So a really cool area of investigation and many other research groups are looking into how relationships affect our brains. Awesome. Thank you so much, Professor Robert Wardinger. Thank you again for joining us today. Um, thank you everyone for joining. I uh, hope you enjoyed the talk.